Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. The book I'm interpreting for you in this issue is the famous work by American writer Faulkner, titled As I Lay Dying. If we were to rank American writers of the 20th century, Faulkner would undoubtedly be in the top three, regardless of the specific order. Faulkner's novels are considered textbook-level works for many writers who came after him. For example, Faulkner created a fictional geographic space in his novels, which in contemporary popular culture is referred to as a universe. The most familiar one to us is the Marvel Universe. This approach is commonly used in comics and movies to make the story more believable. However, novelists have more complex purposes in doing so. They aim to delve deep into their personal experiences and present a panoramic view of a particular place. More importantly, when these two purposes are combined in a novel, a fictional place can be used to depict the universal human condition. This is precisely the significance of Faulkner's meticulous cultivation of Yaknapatafa. Faulkner's literary output was prolific throughout his life, with 19 novels and over 120 short stories to his name. Fifteen of his novels and the majority of his short stories are set in Yaknapatafa. Within this vast body of work, there are six particularly important works that form the heart of Yaknapatafa, including Faulkner's representative work, The Sound and the Fury, and the one we are discussing today, As I Lay Dying. We will produce a separate biography episode to discuss Faulkner's life. For now, let's dive into As I Lay Dying and see what it is all about. This novel tells the story of the Bundren family, who live in Yaknapatafa. The main plot of the novel is quite simple. The matriarch of the Bundren family, Addie, passes away. Her dying wish is to be buried alongside her family. In order to fulfill her wish, the Bundren family embarks on a challenging journey of burial. The majority of the novel focuses on the stories that unfold during their journey. Despite its seemingly ordinary premise, both Faulkner himself and numerous critics hold as I lay dying in high regard. What makes it so special? In the following analysis, I will share the story of As I Lay Dying with you in three parts. First, we'll examine the beginning of the story and the author's intention. The second part will discuss the main plot of the story, and in the third part, we'll analyze the novel's underlying meaning. Part 1. Let's begin by introducing the main characters of the novel, the Bundren family. The Bundrens consist of seven members, with the deceased Addie as the female head and aunts as the male head. They have four sons and one daughter. Each of these children has their own distinct personalities and behaviors. The eldest son, Cash, is what we would call an honest person. He is loyal, sincere, and usually silent and patient. He has a fondness for carpentry and diligently builds a coffin for his mother when she becomes seriously ill. This is his unique way of expressing his emotions towards her. The second son, Darl, appears to be somewhat of a rebel. In the eyes of others, he is both rebellious and eccentric, often uttering words that are difficult to understand. However, he is an introspective rationalist who observes everything around him with a detached perspective, including his mother's illness. The third son, Jewel, is a child who appears cold on the outside but passionate on the inside. He is obsessed with horses, has a proud and irritable temperament, and his intense emotions are not openly displayed. He deeply loves his mother but struggles to express it, resorting to anger as a way to conceal his sadness. Their daughter, Dewey Dell, is like a southern version of Madame Bovary. She is in the early stages of romantic infatuation, yearning for a beautiful love and a life in the city, dissatisfied with her current circumstances. She becomes unmarried and pregnant, unsure of what to do and preoccupied with her own concerns, she hardly spares a thought for her mother and siblings' feelings. The youngest child, Vardaman, is a slightly intellectually challenged child, innocent and naive, and death has not yet entered his realm of comprehension. Lastly, there is Ants, the male head of the Bundren family. Some say he is the most detestable character in Faulkner's writing. From his youth, Ants has used sweating as an excuse to make himself ill and avoid work. He often adopts a pitiful and helpless demeanor, seeking sympathy and assistance from others. These are all manipulative tactics he employs. In summary, he excels at using various soft methods to achieve his own goals, 
completely disregarding the feelings of others. When it comes to laziness and taking advantage, he can be described as resolutely willful and ruthlessly cold. If he were born in tumultuous times, he might have been able to achieve great success based solely on this trait. Faulkner's portrayal of Ansa's manipulative behavior serves another purpose. In the Protestant tradition, diligent work is highly regarded as an esteemed quality and a way for Protestants to serve God, representing their devout faith in God. With this background, Ansa's laziness is not just a personal flaw but also a moral evil. In addition to laziness, Ansa is also highly hypocritical and greedy. It is only when his wife's illness becomes incurable that he symbolically calls for a doctor's visit. Just two days before his wife's passing, he even sends his second son, Darl, and his third son, Jewel, to drive a wagon and deliver goods for a meager $3 fee, causing them to miss their mother's final moments. Before her death, Addie, the female head of the family, had one final wish, to be buried alongside her own family in another town several dozen kilometers away. This request contradicted local customs, as the customary practice was to bury a wife in the family burial ground of her husband's family. Furthermore, it was the rainy season in July, and heavy rain could descend at any moment, making the funeral procession fraught with difficulties and dangers. Addie's wish, although seemingly contrary to common sense and social norms, was not a spur-of-the-moment idea. She had raised this request when her second son, Darl, was born. Having seen through her husband's indifference, selfishness, and hypocrisy, she had become thoroughly disillusioned with marriage and life. She did not want to be trapped here even after death. One might question why Addie did not divorce aunts in such circumstances. It should be noted that even today, divorce is not an easy matter for many women, let alone in the American South over a hundred years ago. The strong religious atmosphere at the time was not conducive to divorce. Additionally, Addie had neither property nor employment, making divorce a complicated process. Therefore, all Addie could do was endure during her lifetime and set boundaries between herself and her husband after death. Unexpectedly, after Addie's death, Ans decided to fulfill his wife's wish. This decision attracted both advice and criticism from the neighbors. Did Ans do this out of love for his wife and respect for her wish? Certainly not. He did it merely to showcase his love and respect for his wife, satisfying his own vanity. Additionally, he wanted to obtain a set of false teeth in town, something he had long desired but had been unable to achieve for various reasons. Now, he could finally make it happen under the pretense of burying his wife. Why wouldn't he seize the opportunity? In summary, Addie's desire to be buried in her hometown brought together this diverse family with distinct personalities. This beginning actually follows a pattern commonly employed by novelists, beginning with death and depicting the lives of those around the deceased. Leo Tolstoy's masterpiece, The Death of Ivan Ilyich, is a benchmark example of such works. The novel starts with Ivan's death and reflects the panoramic view of an entire era, grand and majestic. While As I Lay Dying follows a similar pattern, Faulkner's intention is not to explore the relationship between individual fate and the era but to delve deeply into the meaning of life itself. This point is particularly important. In the past, many critics interpreted As I Lay Dying as a portrayal of the real world corresponding to the novel, namely the fate of impoverished white farmers in the American South. However, such interpretations are not entirely accurate. Clearly, Faulkner's approach is quite different from Tolstoy's. Tolstoy employs a realistic technique of typical characters within typical environments, whereas the Bundan family in Faulkner's work, although adorned in the guise of Southern American farmers, is more akin to characters emerging from mythology. In other words, Faulkner's characters are more abstract and carry symbolic significance. While looking at Ivan Ilyich in Tolstoy's work allows us to perceive the rise and fall of Russia's history at a glance, when we observe the characters in As I Lay Dying, we catch a glimpse of our own existential predicaments. These two writing styles, it is difficult to say which is superior or inferior. Each represents the typical styles of realism and modernism in Western literature, reflecting the evolution of social forms, aesthetic principles, and philosophical ideas in the Western world from the 19th to the 20th century. However, 
When we enter the novel as I lay dying, we must be aware that we cannot interpret the characters as specific individuals from a particular historical period using a realistic approach. Part 2. In the following second part, let's discuss the journey of the funeral procession. On the night of Addie's death, the heavy rain arrived as expected. The rain not only delayed the return of Darl and Jewel, the second and third sons, but also caused the river to swell. In the midst of chaos, the eldest son, Cash, hastily finished building the coffin with the help of neighbors and placed his mother's body inside. Aunts, the father who couldn't sweat, naturally stood on the sidelines as an observer. Afterward, Addie's body remained at home for three days, waiting for Darl and Jewel to return with the wagon. On the third evening, the Bundren family finally set off. They drove a wagon pulled by mules, with Addie's coffin placed on it, and proceeded grandly toward town. Jewel, the third son, rode a horse alone behind the wagon, feeling out of place compared to the others. The children of the Bundren family had different temperaments and personalities, but Jewel's difference from the others was particularly pronounced because he was not Ansa's biological son. After giving birth to Darl, Addie had completely given up on Ansa, and their marriage had become lifeless. Later, Addie had an extramarital affair with the local preacher. Unfortunately, the preacher lacked the courage to confront his own emotions and dared not challenge societal ethics and morals, ultimately abandoning Addie. This plunged Addie into deeper despair. At this point, those familiar with American literature may be reminded of Nathaniel Hawthorne's renowned work, The Scarlet Letter. Addie's story is practically a replica of The Scarlet Letter. Both stories depict the union of a married common woman with a clergyman, and both love affairs are similarly unrecognized. The Scarlet Letter was widely known in the United States at the time. From this perspective, it seems that Faulkner intentionally utilized the setting of the Scarlet Letter to help readers better understand Addie's loneliness and despair. In doing so, readers can better comprehend why she insisted on being buried in her hometown. Just before Addie's death, the preacher had made up his mind to confess the affair to the world, but he was ultimately too slow. Jewel is the child born from the relationship between Addie and the preacher. Clearly, from his name alone, it is evident that Addie favored Jewel among all the children. In addition to Addie, only Darl knows that Jewel is not Ansa's biological son. So he repeatedly asks Jewel, Who is your father? It can be imagined that Jewel must be very angry when Darl asks him this question. Being untimely is a characteristic of Darl. He is the most astute observer in the novel, possessing a prophetic insight into human nature. Generally speaking, such individuals often experience great suffering. The ancient Greek philosopher Socrates once said that there are two types of people in the world, happy pigs and suffering humans, and the difference lies in whether they are willing to use reason. Although this division may be crude, it is not entirely unreasonable. Darl has a clear understanding of reality, but he is powerless to change his own circumstances, so he has to compromise with reality. This makes him immensely tormented. For example, he clearly knows that his father's insistence on burying his mother in her hometown is driven by the desire to get false teeth, but he can only go along with it. Let's continue discussing the Bundren family's journey of the funeral procession. The road is full of hardships. The heavy rain caused the water levels to rise, and after circling along the riverbank, they discovered that several bridges upstream and downstream were either flooded or destroyed. Crossing the bridges smoothly was not an easy task. At this point, they were faced with only two choices, to turn back or to risk crossing the river at a shallower part of the riverbed. The rational choice would be the first option, but Ants, under the pretext of fulfilling his wife's wish, insisted on risking crossing the river. Not only did he risk it himself as a father, but he also entrusted the task of driving the wagon to his three adult sons while he took his daughter, and the youngest son ashore. The neighbors who came to help couldn't help but silently criticize the situation. This father is really not worthy of respect. An accident occurred just as the wagon was about to reach the shore. A piece of floating wood came downstream and hit the wagon with great force. The wagon overturned, the mules pulling it were swept away by the current, and even the coffin was almost lost. In the moment of danger, 
Jewel stepped forward and rescued the coffin from the water, single-handedly carrying it back to the shore. However, Cash wasn't so lucky. He had his leg crushed by the overturned wagon. In response, Ansa's reaction was, luckily, it was the leg that was previously broken. Of course, there was no doctor to be called. Ansa presumptuously used some cement to fix Cash's injured leg. Throughout the rest of the journey, Cash endured the pain of the cement wrapped around his leg, lying on top of his mother's coffin. The scene was both cruel and absurd. When they finally arrived in town, Cash not only had an infected leg but also had to endure the pain of having the cement torn off from his flesh. Of course, these events are discussed later. After the mules were swept away, the immediate concern was how to continue their journey. The urgent task was to find two more mules to pull the wagon. Kind-hearted people in the vicinity offered to lend their own animals temporarily, but Ants muttered a few words about not wanting to owe anyone any favors and turned them down. This statement was clearly just an excuse, as Ants had already made his own calculations. After some bargaining, Ants finally reached an agreement with the owner of a livestock store to exchange Jewel's horse for two mules. Upon hearing this news, Jewel remained silent, mounted his horse, and rode off. Everyone thought that Jewel, who was passionately attached to his horse, would never return. However, later on, the store assistant brought two mules. Jewel himself had taken his horse to the livestock store. Due to his illegitimate status, Jewel's inner turmoil had always been intense, and his character became increasingly extreme. On the one hand, he was full of disdain for his family's actions. On the other hand, he was loyal and courageous, harboring deep feelings for his family. He made a desperate effort to save his mother's coffin when it fell into the water, and he risked his life to retrieve Cash's beloved carpentry tools from the river. Only when he was with his horse could he forget the troubles of reality and find temporary tranquility and calm. Now, out of love for his mother, he had to sacrifice his horse, which was equivalent to sacrificing his own inner peace and tranquility. With Cash having a broken leg and Jewel losing his horse, the Bundren family paid a significant price to bury Addy. But the troubles were not over yet. On the night before reaching the town, the barn where they were staying caught fire. In a critical moment, Jewel rushed into the fire to rescue his mother's coffin. Otherwise, Addy's funeral would have been completed prematurely. What others did not know was that Darl had started the fire. He had his reasons for doing so. From the very beginning, Darl did not agree with the plan to bury their mother in town, and with numerous accidents along the way, delays, the coffin getting soaked, and the scorching July heat, Addie's body had already begun to decay, emitting a strong odor that people shunned. Vultures circled above their heads every day, and their numbers were increasing. In order to end this seemingly devout but actually cruel and absurd journey sooner, Darl set the fire, hoping to put an end to it. Unfortunately, he couldn't fulfill his wish. Others didn't see through Darl's intentions, except for the naive Vardaman, who witnessed the act of arson and told his sister, Dewey Dell. Please note that this foreshadows the final outcome of the novel. Finally, on the tenth day after departure, the family arrived in the town where Addie was born. Before the burial, there was another episode worth mentioning. They hadn't brought a shovel to dig the grave, and according to the suggestions of the sons, they could buy one at the hardware store in town. However, Ans insisted on borrowing one from someone. Darl pointed out mercilessly that Ans was unwilling to spend money for their mother. However, no matter how questionable his motives were, Ans always found a way to make people act according to his will, so in the end, they still didn't buy a shovel. Regardless of the circumstances, the purpose of this journey was ultimately achieved. Addie was successfully buried, although at a great cost. However, if we talk about the most tragic outcome, it would be Darl. Just one day after his mother's burial, he was taken away by the police and admitted to a mental institution. It was revealed that his sister, Dewey Dell, had betrayed him by informing their father and the barn owner about Darl setting fire to the barn. Aunts, in order to avoid any liability, declared Darl as insane, leading to his arrest by the police. During this process, even Jewel sided with the police and helped them restrain his own brother. Why did they treat Darl in this way? 
Upon closer examination, it is not difficult to understand. Darl had questioned Jewel, asking him, Who is your father? He also accused Dewey Dell of eagerly waiting for their mother's death so she could go to town and buy abortive medicine, exposing their father's unwillingness to spend money. No one likes to hear the truth, and Darl's intelligence made him detested and feared by others. However, not everyone returned from this journey empty-handed. Ans, in particular, gained a lot. He not only got his false teeth, paid for with the money Dewey Dell intended to use for abortive medicine, but also found himself a new wife. And guess who? It was the owner of the barn where he borrowed the shovel. In other words, while his wife's corpse was still warm, Ans had already started an affair with someone else. Finally, with his new Mrs. Bundren by his side, Ans proudly introduced her to the children, and the family returned home, thus ending the novel. Part 3 And that's where the story ends. Some say Faulkner only writes about the dark realities, the ugliness of human nature, and the despair of fate. After hearing this story, you may agree with this statement. Cash broke his leg twice and can no longer live a normal life. Jewel lost his beloved horse and the sanctuary within himself, likely to be consumed by anger. Dewey Dell failed to have an abortion, and her future is likely to be more helpless than her mother's. And then there's Darl and Vardaman, one a mad prophet and the other a simple prophet, both outsiders to society, whose ultimate fate is likely to be the mental hospital. In the end, they are all innocent individuals. Even if they have their flaws, they are just the ordinary and harmless imperfections that anyone may possess. Yet they have to endure undeserved hardships, face misfortune, indifference, and criticism. On the contrary, Ants, a cruel, cunning, and greedy person, can obtain whatever he desires and lives comfortably. It is thought-provoking and leaves one wondering about the state of the world. Following the approach of 19th-century realist novelists, they often directed their criticism towards societal injustice, the greed of capitalists, and the inaction of governments. Honest common people fail to receive the rewards they deserve, while lazy villains enjoy a happy ending. It is a clear indication that something is wrong with society. Therefore, depicting such phenomena inevitably becomes a condemnation of the social reality. Consequently, many people believe that as I lay dying aims to expose the tragic circumstances of impoverished white farmers in the American South. However, this interpretation is too simplistic. As I lay dying has grander ambitions, as Faulkner uses allegory to elevate the story into a contemplation of the fate of all humankind. Many critics have noticed that as I lay dying structurally corresponds to the ancient Greek epic The Odyssey. After ten years of the Trojan War, the Greek hero Odysseus overcomes numerous obstacles and finally returns home, driving away the invaders and reuniting with his wife and son. This homeward journey took him a full ten years. In As I Lay Dying, the Bundren family's journey to bury Addy takes exactly ten days. Along the way, they face the advice of the townspeople, floods, fires, and other obstacles that closely resemble those encountered by Odysseus on his journey home. In the ancient Greek epic, Odysseus was not known for his physical prowess. On the contrary, he always presented himself as a man of cunning, with his most famous exploit being the wooden horse that led to the fall of Troy. On his journey home, he relied on various stratagems to escape danger. Intelligence is a neutral attribute, and from the Greek perspective, Odysseus was a resourceful hero. However, from the Trojan viewpoint, he was a cunning trickster. Odysseus was able to portray himself as a positive heroic figure largely because the epic's author took the Greek side. Odysseus may not have been braver or nobler than ordinary people. He was simply more rational and shrewd, skilled at assessing situations and calculating gains and losses. His disguise and secret return to test his wife's fidelity after reaching home reveal a selfish and cold side to his character. In comparison, Isance, the male protagonist of the Bundren family, not a modern version of Odysseus? Didn't he also achieve various goals through stratagems, such as replacing the mules, getting false teeth, and marrying a new wife? He appears more selfish and cold, but that's because we initially take the opposite stance to him. From this perspective, 
Faulkner's intention in writing this novel is not simply to accuse humanity of its alleged downfall. He wants to convey that the fundamental nature of human beings has not changed throughout the ages. Selfishness, coldness, cruelty, and vanity have always been dark and persistent aspects of human nature. This understanding also aligns more with Faulkner's negative view of human nature. However, Faulkner is not despairing because of this. In his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, he repeatedly mentions the word endure. He believes that it is only natural for humanity to endure the weaknesses of human nature and not to overly rely on reason and calculation to overcome difficulties. Instead, he emphasizes the importance of emotions and the interconnections between individuals. Could the tragic fate of the Bundren family stem from Ansa's calculations, the emotional distance between family members, and the inner alienation? This is precisely the ultimate revelation about human history, industrial civilization, and human nature that Faulkner seeks to convey to readers through the modern allegory of As I Lay Dying. All right, As I Lay Dying concludes here. Compared to traditional novels, Faulkner pays more attention to exploring the psychological depths of his characters and depicting their states of existence, rather than describing the zeitgeist, historical trends, or moral norms. As I Lay Dying is not a realistic work that criticizes the social status quo and portrays the fate of impoverished white people in the American South. Faulkner, through the imitation of epic structure, turns the story in the novel into a modern allegory of the human condition. He reveals the dark side of human nature throughout history, questions the harm caused by the proliferation of rationality and calculation on human nature, and emphasizes the importance of emotional and spiritual connections for human existence. Although his view of human nature is not optimistic, believing that in life, one must endure the hardships caused by the weaknesses of human nature, he is not without hope and believes that art and literature can provide enlightenment. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.